verses 11 to 21. It is provided that the cities of refuge should be no sanctuary or shelter to a willful murderer, but even thence he should be fetched, and delivered to the avenger of blood, v. 1113. This shows that willful murder must never be protected by the civil magistrate, he bears the sword of justice in vain if he suffers those to escape the edge of it that lie under the guilt of blood, which he by office is the avenger of. During the dominion of the papacy in our own land, before the Reformation, there were some churches and religious houses, as they called them, that were made sanctuaries for the protection of all sorts of criminals that fled to them, willful murderers not accepted, so that, as Stamford says, in his Pleas of the Crown, Lib 2 c 38, the government follows not Moses but Romulus, and it was not till about the latter end of Henry VIII's time that this privilege of sanctuary for willful murder was taken away, when in that, as in other cases, the word of God came to be regarded more than the dictates of the See of Rome. And some have thought it would be a completing of that instance of reformation if the benefit of clergy were taken away for manslaughter, that is, the killing of a man upon a small provocation, since this law allowed refuge only in case of that which our law calls chance medley. It may be alluded to to show that in Jesus Christ there is no refuge for presumptuous sinners, that go on still in their trespasses. If we thus sin willfully, sin and go on in it, there remains no sacrifice, Hebrew 10:26. Those that flee to Christ from their sins shall be safe in him, but not those that expect to be sheltered by him in their sins. Salvation itself cannot save such, divine justice will fetch them even from the city of refuge, the protection of which they are not entitled to. A Law Against Frauds, v. 14. Here is an implicit direction given to the first planters of Canaan to fix landmarks, according to the distribution of the land to the several tribes and families by lot. Note, it is the will of God that every one should know his own, and that all good means should be used to prevent encroachments and the doing and suffering of wrong. When right is settled, care must be taken that it be not afterwards unsettled, and that, if possible, no occasion of dispute may arise. An express law to posterity not to remove those landmarks which were thus fixed at first, by which a man secretly got that to himself which was his neighbor's. This, without doubt, is a moral precept, and still binding, and to us it forbids. The invading of any man's right, and taking to ourselves that which is not our own, by any fraudulent arts or practices, as by forging, concealing, destroying, or altering deeds and writings, which are our landmarks, to which appeals are made, or by shifting hedges, mere stones, and boundaries. Though the landmarks were set by the hand of man, yet he was a thief and a robber by the law of God that removed them. Let every man be content with his own lot, and just to his neighbors, and then we shall have no landmarks removed. It forbids the sowing of discord among neighbors, and doing anything to occasion strife and lawsuits, which is done, and it is very ill done, by confounding those things which should determine disputes and decide controversies. And It forbids breaking in upon the settled order and constitution of civil government, and the altering of ancient usages without just cause. This law supports the honor of prescriptions. Consuetudo facet use custom is to be held as law. A law against perjuries, which enacts two things. That a single witness should never be admitted to give evidence in a criminal cause, so as that sentence should be passed upon his testimony, v. 15. This law we had before, number 35 colon 30, and in this book, ch. 17 colon 6. This was enacted in favor to the prisoner, whose life and honor should not lie at the mercy of a particular person that had a peak against him, and for caution to the accuser not to say that which he could not corroborate by the testimony of another. It is a just shame which this law puts upon mankind as false and not to be trusted, every man is by it suspected, and it is the honor of God's grace that the record he has given concerning his son is confirmed both in heaven and in earth by three witnesses, 1 Jn 5 7. Let God be true and every man a liar, rom 3 4. That a false witness should incur the same punishment which was to have been inflicted upon the person he accused. If two, or three, or many witnesses, concurred in a false testimony, they were all liable to be prosecuted upon this law. 
the person wronged or brought into peril by the false testimony is supposed to be the appellant, v. 17. And yet if the person were put to death upon the evidence, and afterwards it appeared to be false, any other person, or the judges themselves, ex officio by virtue of their office, might call the false witness to account. Causes of this kind, having more than ordinary difficulty in them, were to be brought before the Supreme Court, the priests, and judges, who are said to be before the Lord, because, as other judges sat in the gates of their cities, so these at the gate of the sanctuary, ch. 1712. There must be great care in the trial, v. 18. A diligent inquisition must be made into the characters of the persons, and all the circumstances of the case, which must be compared, that the truth might be found out, which, where it is thus faithfully and impartially inquired into, providence, it may be hoped, will particularly advance the discovery of. If it appeared that a man had knowingly and maliciously borne false witness against his neighbor, though the mischief he designed him thereby was not effected, he must undergo the same penalty which his evidence would have brought his neighbor under, v. 19. Any c lex est justiar ulla nor could any law be more just. If the crime he accused his neighbor of was to be punished with death, the false witness must be put to death, if with stripes, he must be beaten, if with a pecuniary mulct, he was to be fined the sum. And because to those who considered not the heinousness of the crime, and the necessity of making this provision against it, it might seem hard to punish a man so severely for a few words speaking, especially when no mischief did actually follow, it is added, Thy I shall not pity, v. 21. No man needs to be more merciful than God. The benefit that will accrue to the public from this severity will abundantly recompense it, those that remain shall hear and fear, v. 20. Such exemplary punishments will be warnings to others not to attempt any such mischief, when they see how he that made the pit and digged it has fallen into the ditch which he made.